Probably the most trivial opening would be to tell you that I thought I had a good marriage, but my wife's infidelity caught me off guard. The truth is that our marriage had been going downhill for some time. The shocker was that my loving wife believed that I would obediently fulfill her demands and allow her to humiliate me. To me, it all comes down to people mistaking kindness for weakness. Let me introduce my wife and myself and explain. My name is Kevin Stoffman, I am 42 years old, married to Tammy. Tammy recently turned 40. We have been married for 20 years, and we have a 19-year-old daughter who is a freshman in college. Over the years, our marriage has gotten worse and worse. Tammy became detached and disinterested in our relationship. We were still having sex, but the amount was dwindling. I believe it was turning 40 in the emptiness status that caused my wife to begin to lose her mind. Unfortunately, it was our daughter, Robin, who found the first evidence of my wife's insanity. She was home for Christmas vacation, and on the last day before returning to college, she needed a computer. I was using mine, so I told her to get the spare one in our closet. I didn't realize it had been used since my wife had gotten a new computer for her birthday a few months ago. 30 minutes after I gave the computer to Robin, she burst into my office. Daddy, what is this perverted you're into? I looked at her puzzled. I mean, all that porn you watch and what is this cuckold crap? Robin put the computer in front of me, showing me an untitled folder with a bunch of videos. I've watched a few, and they're all cuckold videos. I can't believe you're into that. How do you know about cuckolds? You're only 19. I asked. Come on, Dad, I'm not a kid. When did you get into this? In shock, I looked at the folder. It's your mom's computer. She's the only one who's ever used it. We continued rummaging through the computer, finding other folders. Another folder had several articles on how to turn your husband into a cuckold. It dawned on me that everything we were looking at was from a few months ago. It was still about an hour before Tammy got back, and I got the idea to look at Tammy's new computer. Robin pulled it out while I turned off the old one. That won't work, she has the new one password protected. I took her hand and led her into the bedroom that was Tammy's office. There was a piece of paper hidden under the desk drawer. Your mom isn't good at remembering passwords. When she got the old computer, I suggested she write down all the passwords and keep them in one place. I opened a drawer and pulled out a piece of paper with the passwords for our home sites. Robin looked at it. There's no password here for her new computer. I know, I said and reached under the desk, pulling out another piece of paper. This is her secret sheet. Like most things, she thinks she's clever hiding this sheet. I've seen her put it here, but I've never looked into it until now. I took a picture of the paper before putting it back in the stash. A few seconds later, her new computer was open, and we started searching through it. We found more videos and articles about cuckolding. Our search was interrupted when we heard the garage door open. We quickly shut down the computer, putting it back. The items we found were perverted but didn't tell us if she had been doing anything other than watching porn. Robin agreed not to say anything on the condition that I keep her informed of my investigation. My investigation was just beginning when Robin returned to school. Robin was certain that her mother was up to something other than watching porn. She had noticed the same changes in my wife's attitude toward me that I had. Tammy's attitude toward Robin had also changed, but in a different direction. I had hoped that Tammy was just interested in porn, but deep down, I knew it was more than that. Due to work and other things, it took almost a week before I had enough free time to search Tammy's computer. It was while going through her browser history that I came across her secret email account. Her secret password list wasn't completely obvious, but there were enough clues to quickly gain access to her email account. Fortunately for me, Tammy saved most of her emails. Most of the emails were related to a certain Miss B. Miss B was her cuckold counselor. There was a long string of conversations in which Miss B convinced Tammy to make me a cuckold. Tammy explained to Miss B that I would agree to do almost anything Tammy asked and never argued with her. 
In most cases, she said, I would rather give in than argue. Miss B thought I must be a weakling and would easily become a willing cuckold. At one point, Tammy asked her what to do if I resisted. Miss B advised her to threaten me with divorce, saying that in a divorce, I would lose everything and live in a shoebox, paying Tammy to entertain her lovers. I had to admit that I was ignorant of divorce law. Of course, I was aware that most men end up on the losing end of a divorce, even if they had done nothing wrong. I immediately made an appointment with one of the best divorce attorneys in town. I sat down with Jackie Stone and told her my situation. Her assistant gave me a form to fill out with our employment history and assets. She would check it out and give me answers in a couple of days. The wide smile on Mrs. Stone's face as I entered her office told me a lot don't worry, Kevin. If you ever have to live in a shoebox, it will be a very nice one. People shouldn't listen to non-lawyers who don't have all the facts. Your wife will be in big trouble if she divorces you. I bet her so-called expert didn't even ask what you both do for a living. Your wife's business is valued at almost a million dollars, but the liquid assets are not even half that amount. We'll demand half the value of the company immediately. She will have to find a way to pay you $500,000 or sell it. Her income will be calculated at the time the suit is filed and will be equal to yours, so she won't get any alimony. I can't advise you on everything yet, but your house is almost paid off. A large loan secured by the house, put into a trust for Robin's college expenses, will keep that money from your wife. You both have almost identical amounts in your retirement funds, so that will be a boost if you decide divorce is the way to go. We can do that. Are there any advantages to filing on the grounds of adultery? I asked. Not in terms of property division, but we could use the evidence you've gathered to force her into a favorable settlement. I think it would hurt her business if her activities became public. Mrs. Stone agreed to prepare the papers and wait for my signal to have her served. We had no proof of adultery other than emails, but it looked like she was getting to that point. We could use this time to shelter some extra money from Tammy's grasp. I informed Robin of what I had found and what the divorce attorney had said. You think she's going to try to make a sucker out of you? What a... She can't possibly think you'd agree to that. It's partly my fault. I give her everything she wants. I have to stop it now. Wait, Dad. Maybe you should play along with her. Do you really think she'll stop if you put a stop to it? She'll just cover it up. Play along and trap her. Oh, I like that. I continued to monitor Tammy's secret email account. Mistress B had instructed Tammy to deprive me of sex and begin requiring me to do most of the household chores. Tammy should have gauged my reaction to her becoming more rude and demanding. Tammy should have told me that if I did everything she told me to do, I would be rewarded with sex. Mistress B told her to always find flaws in my performance to deprive me of sex. My submission would signal that I was willing to be her cuckold. I considered opposing her, but Mistress B said that if I didn't agree, she would change her plans and cuckold me in secret. As Robin suggested, I agreed to her plan. I played my role as the obedient husband. I was so angry with her that I was happy not to have sex with Tammy, but I was disappointed when she refused to have sex. I realized the end was near when I read the letter Tammy had sent to Mistress B informing her that she had found her bull. He was a vendor for one of the suppliers for her business. Mistress B told Tammy that she should try out her new bull before laying out the plan to me. I hadn't given up hope that Tammy would come to her senses before committing adultery. My blood boiled when, a week after Tammy announced that she had found her bull, I read the letter. It was addressed to Mistress B, I have tried my bull in all positions. I am ready to make my husband a cuckold. Finding out the identity of the bull was easy. There were several new letters from one Stephen Rose. He was thanking Tammy for a great night of sex. In the last letter, dated yesterday afternoon, Tammy was telling him how she couldn't wait to put me in my place. He thought it over, and Steve said he couldn't wait to make a cuckold out of me. After doing a little research, I learned everything I could about Stephen Rose. It was hard to believe he was going to be my bull. 
I thought a bull was an imposing figure of a man. If I picked Stephen Rose correctly, and I knew I did, he was 5 feet 10 inches tall and about 180 pounds my height is just over 6 foot tall at 200 pounds true, he was 10 years younger than me, but judging by the pictures, I could have overpowered him on my worst day. Steve was a traveling salesman, a supplier to Tammy's business. He was married and had two small children. I felt sorry for what was about to happen to his family. For the next two weeks, I monitored their emails. Steve was kind enough to take some POV pictures of my wife. I'm sure he had no idea that he had sent me the evidence I needed to prove my wife's adultery and destroy his own marriage. Finally, the letter arrived. Tammy had written to Mistress B that she was ready to make me a cuckold. She thought I was ready, and her bull was willing. Friday night was going to be the night. Tammy was going to impose her new rules on me before Steve came to her. If I didn't agree immediately, she would resort to threatening me with divorce. Tammy even told Mistress B that she had a special gift for me to put me in my place. Mistress B, based on my agreement with all of her previous humiliating actions, assured Tammy that I would comply. I had three days to prepare when I learned of the plan. My attorney had finalized the divorce papers and gave me a copy. I had already gotten Steve's wife's email address and phone number. Robin was shocked when I told her the details of her mother's plan, but she liked the way I was going to react. Robin had to be on standby to do her part in my plan. Tammy was sitting at the kitchen table when I walked in. She looked a little nervous. I turned on the digital recorder I had in my pocket. Kevin, sit down. I need to talk to you about something. I tried not to smirk. Can I change first? She spoke in her authoritative voice, no. You're going to sit down and listen. You will not interrupt. I sat down in my chair, placing my briefcase next to me, and nodded to her. We're going to have some changes here, and you're going to have to deal with them. First of all, I'm going to have a lover. He's coming over tonight to have sex with me. Your involvement will be limited to cleaning up after me and getting him ready for work after he has sex with me. You will continue to do chores and do whatever I tell you to do. Tammy paused, and I cut in. Is that all? No. I have a little gift you're going to start wearing. You'll wear it all the time, and I'll have the only key. Go ahead and open it. She held out a wrapped box to me. Inside the box was a chastity cage. I'd seen a few of these in the videos Tammy had posted on her computer. I took the cage in my hands. Are you done? Yes. I know it's going to be a big change, but you'll get used to it and do as you're told. Tammy looked nervous now. I think she expected a different reaction from me. I want to warn you that there will be consequences if you don't agree. I held back but chuckled slightly. Are you done now? Tammy nodded. Aren't you supposed to tell me that if I don't comply, you'll divorce me, and I'll be living in a shoebox? Well, yes. Those are some of the consequences, so you'd better just go along with it. Her voice shook a little and became less authoritative. I pulled out my cell phone, sending a pre-planned email to Steve's wife, and then dialed Robin's number. Yes, honey. She told me everything. You won't believe this, but she just gave me a chastity cage. Tammy tried to pull herself together. Hang up the phone. Who the hell were you talking to? I looked at her with a snarl. I better let you go, honey. I have to deal with this. Putting the phone down on the table, I looked at my wife and clapped my hands loudly. Don't ever interrupt me when I'm talking to my daughter, I said in a calm but firm voice. Tammy stood there at a loss for words. Okay, I've got your attention. Let's recap what you just told me. If I understand correctly, your plan is for some guy to come to our house tonight and you. I'm supposed to watch you sleep with him and then wipe you down. I guess this will continue, and I'll become your faithful cuckold. Oh yes, I must wear this cage that only you have the key to. Final blow, if I don't agree, you'll divorce me taking everything I've gained and forcing me to live in a shoebox, right? 
Confidence returned to Tammy as she realized things were still going her way. Yeah, that's exactly how it's going to go, she said. I picked up my briefcase, placed it on the table, and opened it. Tammy, get your phone out and call Steve. Her confidence quickly faded. What? Who's Steve? I snatched the phone out of her hands, unlocked it, and dialed Steve's number from her contacts, putting it on speaker. You know, Steve, you're bull. Steve answered on the first ring. Hey babe, how's that wimp? Sorry, Steve, but it's not babe, it's wimp. I need to ask you some questions. There was a brief silence on the line before I continued, Steve, when you started sleeping with my wife, did you tell her you were married and had two small children? Tammy sighed, and judging by her reaction, I guess the answer was no. More importantly, did you tell your wife that you were going to spend the evening having sex with my wife? The silence on the other end of the line answered my question. Don't worry, I've taken care of that for you. I'm sure your wife will take it very well. And by the way, I really appreciate the pictures of you having sex with my wife. I'm sure your wife can use them in the divorce, just as I will. You son of a, I'm going to kill you. Steve screamed on the phone. Oh my god, that sounds like a threat to do me serious bodily harm, I said sarcastically. I reached into my briefcase, pulling out my gun. Tammy shrieked when she saw it. Tammy, shut up. I'm talking to your bull. I looked at the gun and then back at the phone. Steve, do you know guns? This is a .45 caliber handgun. That sound you just heard? That's me sliding around into the chamber. Silence again on the other end of the line. I recently wondered what a .45 caliber bullet could do to a man's balls. If you show up at my door, we'll both find out. More silence. I looked at Tammy, who was beginning to panic. Looks like he hung up on me. I didn't even have time to tell him that I sent some of his emails to his employer. Did you know they have a strict rule against having sex with their clients? I said mockingly. Sit down, Tammy. You were right, we have a lot to talk about. Taking the cage in my hands, I examined it closely. It's small, I said, tossing it onto the table. Really small. There's no way mine would fit in here. You know that. This is just one of the many blunders you've made, my dear wife. Did you really think I would go along with all this crap? Tammy began to stammer, tears welling up in her eyes. Kevin, I, I interrupted, pulling a folder out of my briefcase. What's this, she asked, her voice cracking, ready to cry. It's a divorce petition, I said coldly. My attorney, who actually went to law school, told me to tell you that you should never take legal advice from an internet. Let me tell you the main point first, you're not going to take everything away from me, and I'm not going to live in a shoebox. Let's start with our assets, shall we? Tammy's hands were shaking. Kevin, please, you see, I continued, ignoring her, we live in a 50-50 state. That means we are each entitled to half of our marital assets. Did you tell your counselor that you owned a successful business? Tammy shook her head silently. No, I didn't think so. You noticed that I claim half of the business you built during our marriage. I remember that the last loan appraisal you received valued the company at a million dollars. In the divorce, I am demanding $500,000 in cash. But. But that appraisal was only done to secure the loan. My company has no such assets. Tammy stammered, her face pale. Oh dear, you may have to sell your business, I said nonchalantly. Secondly, I'm not asking for maintenance. Luckily for you, the salary you get from the company and the benefits you receive are equal to my current salary. What? You make more money than me, and you know it, she protested. There you go again, listening to some internet. You see, your salary is based on what you get from your company, along with perks like a car, travel, and other benefits. Too bad you'll have to sell it to pay off your debt to me. You son of a, you planned this. Tammy cried, her face contorting in rage. 
No, let me stop you there, I said, my voice icy. You planned this, and I'm just reacting to your plans. How is your plan working so far? Tammy burst into tears, sobbing uncontrollably. I don't want a divorce, Kevin. Can't we settle this somehow? Settle it? You're out of your mind. You gave me a chastity cage and slept with a snot-nosed weasel. I don't know what happened that made you lose your mind, but I'm done. Just so you know, I knew about your little plan all along. It just proves that you think kindness is a weakness. I'll fix that. I'm not going to be kind to you anymore. I'm going to treat you like the piece of you've turned into. Tammy cried harder, trying to plead with me. Kevin, I'm so sorry. I was looking for something new, and I gave in to the excitement. Please, can we just forget about all of this? I realize how wrong I was to force you into this. You wanted excitement, and I'm going to give it to you, I said, standing up. This is going to be exciting for you, going to divorce court. It's going to be so exciting for you to tell your family what you've turned into. And finally, you're going to have to sell your business to pay me back. Look how exciting your life has become. Tammy continued to assure me that she was sorry and didn't want things to turn out this way. She had been crying for over an hour when someone started banging on the front door. Judging by the loud knocking, I was sure I knew who was behind the door. I grabbed my .45 and went to the door. As I approached, a voice yelled from the other side, Open the door, you son of a. I backed away from the door and pulled out my cell phone, dialing 911. Yes, I need the police to come to my house immediately. My wife's boyfriend is standing at the door threatening me. I don't know if he's armed, but I am. If he comes through the door, I will shoot him to protect myself. I hung up the phone but left the line connected to 911. Steve, get away from my door. I've called the police, and they're on their way, I shouted through the door. Steve was already pounding harder on the door, trying to break it down. I'm going to kill you, you bastard. I was tempted to unlock the deadbolt, let him break in, and shoot him, but before I could, I heard sirens howling outside. Through the door, I could hear police officers yelling at Steve to show his hands and move away from the door. When he didn't comply, I heard one of the officers announce, Taser deployed. We later learned that Steve's wife had lost her temper when she received my email. Her father lived in the neighborhood, and he was already waiting for Steve when he arrived at my door. Steve barely managed to save his life before driving back to my house. After the arrest, I noticed large dents on the side of his car, likely from a baseball bat. I wished his father-in-law had caught him before he tried to break into our house, it might have saved him from jail time. The incident with Steve helped me get a restraining order against him, although I wouldn't have needed one until he was out of jail. I threatened Tammy with a restraining order if she didn't move out. I knew no judge would agree to that, but she didn't. Tammy moved in with her parents, kicking and screaming the whole time. She kept wanting to talk, saying she didn't want a divorce. Tammy hired an attorney who insisted on meeting in person to work out the details of the divorce. Mrs. Stone told me to be prepared for a fight, as the lawyer Tammy hired was, in her words, a real scumbag. He was loudmouthed but not very intelligent, she said, and I shouldn't let him intimidate me. As expected, Tammy and her attorney tried to talk me out of the divorce during our first meeting. Tammy sat across from me, looking more composed than she had the last time I'd seen her, but I could still see the nervousness in her eyes. Kevin, she began in a soft, sweet voice, this whole thing was a mistake. I thought it would strengthen our marriage. You have to believe me, Steve and I never had sex. I didn't cheat on you. I just stared back at her, saying nothing. Her scraggly lawyer cleared his throat, trying to appear confident. Mr. Stopman, he said, we're willing to forget all this nonsense and forgive your baseless accusations of Mrs. Stopman's infidelity. But if you insist on continuing, we will countersue you for slandering Mrs. Stopman's good name. I laughed and looked at my lawyer, who smirked back at me. You said they would try that, I said. Mrs. Stone opened one of the folders she had brought and slid some pictures across the table to Tammy and her lawyer. 
I think these will prove otherwise. This is a picture of your client with a man who is definitely not her husband. I don't think there's much room to argue about what's going on here. Tammy's face paled as she looked at the photos. Her lawyer went silent. This is a picture of you, Tammy, I said coldly. I don't think this counts as not cheating. Steve takes good pictures, doesn't he? Did you forget to mention to your lawyer that I have these? Tammy's lawyer began to stammer. Mr. Stoffman, I cut him off. And did my soon-to-be ex-wife also forget to tell you that Steve took these pictures? I didn't need a private investigator, Steve handed me all the evidence I needed. Tammy was crying now, her face buried in her hands. I'm not stopping the divorce, I said firmly. You can resist all you want, but I'm done with you. I pushed another picture toward her lawyer, showing the chastity cage she had tried to force me into. Here's a picture of what she wanted me to wear. No, I will not forgive or forget what she's done. The room was silent for a few moments as Tammy's lawyer and she whispered to each other. I couldn't hear everything, but it was obvious that Tammy hadn't told him about the photos or Steve's involvement. She kept saying, I didn't believe he had pictures. I had my eyes closed while he was sleeping with me. Mrs. Stone suggested we take a break to give the attorneys time to talk with their clients. When we returned, Tammy had a completely different look on her face. The sweet, apologetic facade was gone, replaced by a hard, determined expression. Her lawyer began speaking again. We're going to request counseling. Mrs. Stoffman believes that you can work through this with the help of a professional. Mrs. Stone had warned me about this tactic. I nodded and said, fine. I'll endure as many sessions as they schedule, but it won't change my mind. Tammy's lawyer continued, if counseling doesn't resolve the situation, we'll need to talk about property division. Your current demands are completely unreasonable. For instance, demanding $500,000 for Mrs. Stoffman's company is absurd. We should have an independent valuation before discussing any figures. Tammy looked directly at me, trying to seem confident, but her voice wavered slightly as she said, you know my company isn't worth that much. You're asking for way too much. Mrs. Stone smirked and opened another folder. She slid a stapled document across the table toward Tammy and her lawyer. I think you'll recognize this document, she said calmly. This is your loan application for your business. If you look at the last page, you'll find your signature, under penalty of perjury, attesting to the fact that the value of your business is just over a million dollars. You mailed this to the bank after it was notarized. If you're now saying that the value of your business isn't true, that's very disturbing. Not only are you admitting to perjury, but you've also committed mail fraud by sending false information through the postal service. Tammy's face went white, and her lawyer looked panicked. I, I didn't know. Mrs. Stone continued, the federal government takes mail fraud very seriously, as does the bank. You might want to rethink your position on the value of your business. I leaned back in my chair, chuckling. Well, Tammy, it looks like you might be the one who ends up in a cage. Tammy turned to her lawyer, whispering furiously. After a few minutes, her lawyer cleared his throat and announced that the meeting was over. A week later, I was shocked to find Tammy standing on my doorstep. Tammy looked like a complete wreck. Her hair was disheveled, and her eyes were red and puffy, as though she hadn't slept in days. Please, Kevin, we need to talk, she pleaded. I opened the door and let her into the kitchen, where we had had so many arguments before. Didn't we already do this the night you planned to make me a cuckold? I asked coldly. What do you want to talk about? Tammy slumped into a chair, tears streaming down her face. I can't do this, Kevin. I was wrong. I was stupid. I'm losing everything, my mind, my business, and worst of all, Robin. She won't talk to me. Every time I call, she says I may and hangs up on me. I'm going to lose my business, and you're trying to put me in jail. My parents are mad at me. I overheard my dad telling my mom that I may, and they want me out of the house. 
Steve's wife came to my parents' house and threatened to beat me up. I'm losing everything. It sounds like you got exactly what you deserved, I said coldly. Isn't that exciting? Tears continued to stream down her face as she begged, you're not really going to put me in jail, are you? I leaned forward, my voice low and steady. I'm not the one putting you in jail, Tammy. Your actions are the reason you're in this mess. I'm just holding you accountable for them. I'm sorry, Tammy sobbed. I got caught up in the excitement of everything I saw on the internet. That woman, Mistress B, told me you'd love it. She said the fact that you took over the household chores and didn't complain showed that you liked to be dominated. I scoffed. Or maybe I'm just a nice guy who wanted to make his wife happy. But I'm done, Tammy. We're wasting our time here. I suggest you drop the counseling and start looking for a buyer for your business. Two months later, we found ourselves back in the same conference room at my attorney's firm. Tammy looked even worse than she had the last time I saw her. She was completely shattered, her confidence and arrogance gone. Mrs. Stone told me that Tammy had contracted to sell her business. After paying off her loans, she would only get about $400,000, far less than what she had hoped for. Our original demand had been for half, but we rejected that and started demanding everything. The final meeting was to work out the details of the settlement. Tammy's lawyer pushed a folder across the table to Mrs. Stone. My client agrees to the latest settlement offer. Mr. Stoffman will receive sole ownership of the marital home, and both parties will retain their retirement accounts. The bank accounts have already been split 50-50 and will remain that way. Regarding Mrs. Stoffman's business, once the $400,000 from the sale is received, Mr. Stoffman will get a check for $320,000. Mrs. Stone nodded. I don't think there's any need to put anything else in writing, including the loan agreement. Tammy's lawyer agreed, and we signed the papers. I felt a pang of pity for Tammy as I looked across the table. Tears were streaming down her face as she asked quietly, can we talk for a few minutes? I looked at Mrs. Stone, who gave me a slight nod before leaving the room. I agreed to hear what Tammy had to say, though I wasn't expecting much. I'm so sorry, Kevin, she whispered. I know I have no chance of regaining your trust, but could you please help me with Robin? She won't talk to me. She calls me horrible names and won't agree to meet with me. I'm losing my daughter. Please. I leaned forward and met her tear-filled eyes. What did you expect, Tammy? Did you really think she would support you after everything you tried to do? After you tried to put me in a cage and humiliate me? I can't change her mind for you. You'll have to figure that out yourself. Tammy lowered her head and shuffled out of the conference room. I wanted so badly to ask her how she was dealing with all this unrest she'd brought upon herself, but that would be too much. I'd done enough already.